Okay, good morning. Good to see you all today. And uh, just to remind you that the quiz is due on Friday. There is quiz number four out there, so please get that done. And uh, secondly, that's the first thing. The second thing is to recall that this is Native American Heritage Month. And so to honor that, I am, I am uh, going over briefly some uh, Native American Catholics who are on their way to sainthood. I talked last time about St. Kateri Tekakwitha, who is actually, was canonized um, a few years ago or a couple years ago. It took a long time. I don't know why it took so long. But anyways, she, uh, she was canonized. And now here is this gentleman. You can see him. He's standing here on the, on the, on the left. This gentleman here, not this gentleman. This gentleman here, Nicholas Black Elk. Nicholas Black Elk lived from 1863. Name, name down. Nicholas Black Elk, 1863 until 1950. He was born in the state of Wyoming, but maybe on, I wonder if he was born on a reservation. I didn't see that in what I looked at. But anyways, he was born in the state of Wyoming. Certainly he's an American. He's a Native, <laughs> Native American, part of the indigenous peoples of this country. Here for His people were here for a long time before any Europeans showed up. Um, he uh, was part of the uh, Lakota, the Lakota, well, you know, um, Indian tribes have a lot of sub sub levels and stuff like that. Generally, it's the Sioux, the Sioux Nation, but uh, there are apparently three subgroups of the Sioux, and he was of the Lakota subgroup. Lakota, whoops, make that an O. Lakota, and then out of the Lakota, of many subgroups of the Lakota, he was part of the Aglala tribe. So he's called Aglala Lakota. He was a medicine man, which is another word for a holy man, a religious, you could say a religious leader among, amongst the Aglala Lakota. I don't know if that's because of by birth or he was made one or whatever, but anyways, he was, no, he was a medicine man. And uh, just some interesting facts about his life. Um, one fact you can see here already in the picture, this is a picture uh, of him uh, working for the wild, uh, the Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. I don't know if you if you ever heard of Buffalo Bill, but he was this dude who had this whole kind of it's kind of like a circus in a way, and went around traveling America and traveling the world, and it was all about the Wild West. So you had cowboys and Indians, of course, and the cowboys would do rope tricks and horse, you know, jumping off of horses and on horses and. The Indians would do their native dances and do all sorts of stuff like that, you know, bow and arrow stuff. And he was part of that. You know, guys got to earn a living, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's what he did. Uh, he also, another interesting fact, fought in the Battle of Little Bighorn, which if any of you know American history, you might have heard of General George Armstrong Custer and um, the, uh, the, the soldiers who fought against Indian tribes in the Battle of Little Bighorn forget where it was. I want to say it was in the Dakotas, but I forget. Anyways, and the, the American, the, the cavalry, U.S. cavalry tribes were basically massacred. They were soundly beaten by the, by the Indians. Um, so he was part of that. So he was involved in, in, in that battle. It's always interesting because people wonder, like, you know, uh, when you learn about American history and it's like, you know, well, you know, Americans just kind of swept across the continent. and were the, in, the Indians were there. Didn't they do anything? Well, yeah, there were things called the Indian Wars in the 1800s. I mean, the Indians tried to resist. They had armed resistance. But, you know, our, our, our military was too powerful for them and, and, uh, and defeated them so, and put them on reservations. So, anyways, it's not like the Indians didn't try to not have their land taken. They certainly did for a long, long time. Uh, anyways, what do I want to say? Uh, what do I want to jump to now? Oh, okay. 19, around the, his wife, 
he had a wife and children, and his, his first wife became a Roman Catholic. She converted to Roman Catholicism, and then, then she died. And in 1904, after her death, Black Elk decided also to become Roman Catholic. But he was a little bit of, a, of, a, of an outlier of a Roman Catholic because he still kind of practiced his role as a medicine man. He still kind of mixed in his Lakota religious practices with his Catholic practices. So he was kind of uh, had a duality there, a double double belonging, sometimes they call it. He was fully into his Native American religion and religious beliefs, apparently, but also fully into his Catholic beliefs. I don't know how he made it work. Somehow it worked for him. Um, I don't know if I could make it work, and we'll, we'll see what that has to do with his sainthood as they investigate. But he became a Catholic. In uh, 1932, he became popular because um, in 1932, uh, a person spoke with him. I don't know if the guy was an anthropologist or whatever, but he spoke with Black Oak and got his stories, the stories of his life and of his native peoples, and published that in a book called Black Elk Speaks. And that book, since the 1970s, um, has become very popular amongst Native American uh, people fighting for justice for Native Americans, and it gives them an eye into a firsthand account into people, you know, what it was like to really live Native American, uh, a Native American life before it was basically destroyed by the coming of uh, Europeans, or I should say it's heavily modified, it's another way to put it. In 2016, the Diocese of Rapid City, South Dakota, which I was at one time. I, uh, actually, I was there back when Bishop Chapu, who used to be the, the Archbishop of Philadelphia, he was the Bishop of Rapid City when I was out there. I visited a friend. We drove a truck from Rapid City all the way to, uh, to uh, just outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is a nice little road trip. Anyways, in 2016, the Diocese of Rapid City opened the cause for his sainthood, and right now he is at the level of servant of God. He's servant of God, Nicholas Black Elk. Um, I, personally, I don't know how far it will get. I don't know. The fact that he mixed and matched religions might might be an issue, but nevertheless, well, you know, uh, I, I'm not, I don't know that that excludes him from heaven. Who am I to say? But uh, certainly he apparently was a holy man or known as a holy man, a good man. Man. And so he is on the way. So I ask Servant of God Nicholas Black Elk for his prayers and prayers on the uh, Lakota peoples and on all the Native American peoples of our country that they may be blessed and that they may be prosper. That they may prosper. Amen. Okay. I think I got everybody. Yes. Okay, I'm not sure how much I want to talk about this, but we'll, I'll maybe make a few comments. Okay, from a from a Christian perspective, if we look at the virtues from um, a biblical perspective or a judeo-christian perspective um there's really no old testament the jews didn't have the same kind of notion of virtue as you find in the philosophical ideas of say the greeks and the romans the the you know for jews the religion was paramount and for for many ancient peoples they had no were they had a word for religion they certainly did but they didn't, it was very different from, their concept was very different from us today. They didn't have this kind of division between religion and the secular world. Everything involved the gods. Everything involved the spiritual and the supernatural. There was no distinction in reality. And the same thing for the Jews. There was, to be a Jew, there, there was no real distinction between the normal world and, say, the supernatural world. There, there was no difference. It was all under God's control. So, you know, for virtue... To, uh, there was no term in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures that was equivalent to virtue. For the Jews, virtue was righteousness. Okay, so you see the definition there on the PowerPoint. Righteousness, tzedakah in Hebrew, was the emphasis for Jews. To live according to God's will. To do what God wants, to bring yourself in conformity with God's will. That was the, the primary um, uh, emphasis for a Jewish, a, a good Jewish life. 
that was what benefited the human person. And so that's what you see in the Bible. You see this emphasis on righteousness, doing what is right, doing what is according to God's will, a life of righteousness. <laughs> You know, righteousness contains the sense and condition of one's relationship with God, you know, whose laws and norms, his moral norms, require a deeper and a full, a more radical commitment than just following the rules. And this is kind of different from virtue as I've described it here with, when we look at the Greek and the Roman philosophers, especially the Greek philosophers or Greek and Roman society. Because remember, virtue is a human condition. It's, it's something, it's a disposition that you create. And remember, when I, if you remember, when I was talking about virtue in the other class, I never mentioned God. It, it had no basis in, in the gods that they believe Zeus or Hera or uh, Poseidon, the various gods that were, were present in the, uh, in the Greek pantheon of various um, immortal uh, god beings, and also godlike beings, because they're also half-human, half-god hybrids like Hercules um, and others. Um, you know, you could practice virtue without the gods. You didn't have to. You didn't need the gods to practice virtue. It was part of human nature, and it was something that you could do. And in fact, it was kind of, it's kind of funny because, given the stories about the gods, one of the problems for philosophers was to dis discuss why the gods weren't virtuous. <laughs> you know? Because so often in the stories of the gods, you know, the gods would get enraged, Zeus would get enraged and do things which would show a lack of virtue, a lack of, say, prudence, or a lack of control of his passions, of his emotions. Whereas the Jewish God was different. The Jewish God was totally in control, totally good, totally righteous, and you were supposed to be like him. You were supposed to be righteous like him. How were you righteous like him? Well, do what he told you to do. He tells you this is how you should act if you want to be like me. So there's a difference there in, in the perspective. Because you want to be like God, whereas for virtue, for the Greeks and the Romans, the pagans, it was it didn't necessarily have any connection to the gods at all. You could sim it was simply a human disposition which you actuated, you made actual or possible by your actions. Let's see here, Ms. Reyes is here. Okay. I'm not going to focus too much on this. I'm going to skip through it so I can get ahead a bit. I'll move with that. But I did want to stop here because later on in the Jewish writings, you have what's called the wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. And it's called wisdom literature because it talks about the practical application of of God's laws, you know, we've got the principles, all right, the practical application of the principles. You know, you believe in God, but, you know, you should act like God, but what does that mean to act like God? And, and so you have a, a number of books in the Bible that are called wisdom literature, and they usually have, you know, some of them have little proverbs, you know, about how you're, you know, little statements about how you're supposed to live life, um, you know, a proverb is something like cleanliness is next to godliness. It's a short little statement that tells you how to live. Okay, that's a, a wisdom saying. All right. Um, but they have that's not in the Bible, but I'm just giving you an example. Uh, and so you have books like the book of Proverbs or you have this book, like which is called the book of wisdom, which talks about what wisdom is and how it's connected to God. You have books like the Book of Sirach, which is a long book with all sorts of proverbs and discourses, little discourses and poems about how to live a good life. That's the thing with wisdom literature, Miss Springart. How to live a good life. Yes? Yes, to live a good life, to smile and be happy. And but part of the this move towards wisdom literature in Judaism was was um I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, was, was the influence or part of this move towards the wisdom literature, the creation of wisdom literature in Judaism, was its encounter with other cultures which had wisdom literature. And so the Jews were like, well, we want wisdom literature of our own. We have, we're wise people too, and our God has made us wise and given us wise laws, so let's talk about it and let's have our own wisdom literature too. So you have wisdom literature develop amongst the Jews. What I find interesting about this from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 8, is here we have the Bible taking over the, tr the cardinal virtues, the traditional virtues, and praising them. And that's why I think it's significant, and that I'll, I'll look at it. 
it's in the context of a poem to Lady Wisdom. Wisdom is portrayed as a woman, a, a beautiful woman, who um, you know, who uh, who gives out her benefits uh, of wisdom to those who seek her. She is something to be sought. And so the author of we don't know who wrote the book of wisdom, but the author writes this poem to Lady Wisdom, and in the context of that, he says this. I'll assume it's a he. It could have been a she, but you never know. Indeed, Lady Wisdom spans the world from end to end mightily, powerfully, and she governs all things well. Her I loved and sought after from my youth. I sought to take her for my bride and was enamored of her beauty. So the author wants to, Wisdom is so beneficial, he wants to marry her, have Wisdom kind of as his wife, well, not kind of, as his wife. She adds to nobility the splendor of companionship with God. Even the ruler of all loves her or loved her. So she adds to no, nobility is another way of, um, you know, it's, nobility is a good thing. Something that is noble is something that's good. Um, so she adds to goodness the splendor of being with God, union with God. And even the ruler, and this is referring to God, even God loves wisdom. Because, of course, God should be wise. For she leads into the understanding of God and chooses his works. She helps us to know who God is and what God is. If riches are desirable in life, what is richer than wisdom who produces all things? So it's kind of making an argument here. If, you, if having a lot of money, you know, what's better, if that's desirable, what's better than wisdom, which, which gives you everything, including money? If you're wise, although I, I don't know if that's the point of life, but nevertheless, it's just an argument, you know, trying to say, hey, if you want to be rich, it's better to be rich in wisdom than to be rich in riches. And here we get into the virtues. If prudence is at work, who in the world is a better artisan than she? So we have the mentioning of the virtue of prudence as something that is, you know, you want prudence, but who's better than prudent? Remember, another word for prudence is wisdom. So if prudence is at work, who in the world is a better artisan than she? She is, the, the author sees wisdom as part of God's creation of the world. Think here of the eternal law. God creates the world out of his own wisdom. Wisdom, which is a kind of knowledge. Of God knows how he wants things to be and wills them to be that way. Or if one loves righteousness, whose works are virtues, she teaches moderation and prudence righteousness and fortitude, and nothing in life is more useful than these. So we see here in Revelation, because the it's, Book of Wisdom is part of the Bible, um, we see here in God's Revelation an approval being given to the practice of the virtues. They are practiced by the wise. Interestingly here, it seems that that righteousness is given as the equivalent of justice. In other words, that God is, what does God do? God is due in justice the following of his will. So I will note that. So that gives you the perspective of the author, okay? Righteousness is, is uh, substituted, or ju righteousness is substituted for justice. But here we have them, the cardinal virtues. We have prudence, we have moderation, which is temperance, righteousness, which is justice, and fortitude, which is courage. And it's approved by the biblical author as something that should be practiced by the Jew and, by extension, by the Christian, since Christians accept the Jewish revelation. Yeah, maybe I'll... Okay, maybe I'll do this. Just because this is from a, the first thing I gave you, the Book of Wisdom is from the Old Testament. I'll give you something from the New Testament. This is from the letter to the Philippians, a letter by a man named Paul, St. Paul. I can't really tell you who he is. It would take too long, but he was, he was a Christian. He was uh, an early Christian. He was not a follower of Jesus, but he converted to Christianity. He was a Jewish rabbi. And much of the New Testament are the letters of Paul, uh, interestingly enough, a guy who did not know Jesus but came to follow him later. And uh, in this letter to the Philippians, the Philippians were people who lived in the city of Philippi, which is in, uh, uh, which is in Greece. Let me show you where that is. 
if I remember. Let's see here. Where are you, my friend? There we go. Google Maps. Okay, and if I remember where Philippi, what you can see here, the country of Greece and other countries, and Greece is in Europe. And if I remember correctly, Philippi is up here in the north, if I remember correctly. Um, don't quote me because I could be wrong, but I'm like 90% sure it's up here. Ancient Philippi is up here in the north of Greece. So there was a Christian community there, a Christian church, and Paul wrote a letter to them, I believe in the 50s. It would be dated to the 50s AD. If I remember my Pauline literature notes correctly. Anywho, again, don't quote me because I could be wrong, but I believe it's the 50s AD. I'm almost certain it's the 50s. Um, anyways, the letter to the Philippians. And in that letter, it's called the letter of joy because... Paul rejoices. He keep using, use, keeps using the word rejoice. I rejoice in how well you're living the Christian faith. And in the, in the process of talking to the Philippians, he has this short comment, which is very interesting. He says, finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So one could say the true, the beautiful, the good, anything that's true and beautiful and good, wherever you find it, wherever you find it, it doesn't have to be in Christianity. You can find uh, truth and beauty and goodness in other cultures and other religions. Um, because why? Because we have intellects. We can. We have reason. We can. We have that ability to perceive the truth. We seek out the truth. It's part of our human nature. With, from the natural law, it's part of our human nature to seek out truth and reality. We are drawn. We are inclined to beautiful things, to the good. That's why we should avoid something that's not good. That's not a benefit to us. So you know, any of those things should be considered by Christians. But the most important point about this quotation, and I put here the Greek word arete, arete in brackets. Why? Because arete is virtuous. Arete is the Greek word for virtue, which also means manliness in Greek. <laughs> it comes from arsen, which means a male human being. So anyway, so, but we'll ignore that. Notice they don't translate it that way, because that's not how he means it here. It's translated here in the New American Bible, Revised Edition, as excellence. But you literally should translate it virtue, I think. It really, that's more appropriate. If there is any virtue, think about these things. So we have, not just in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, but also in the Greek Christian Scriptures, um, an affirmation, if there is anything that is virtuous, Christians should be involved with that. They should be concerned about it and, and uh, be interested in it. So here we have approval from the New Testament. So it's not surprising that you find that Christians take over, they see the truth of the, in the practice of the virtues, and they take it over into Christianity. They kind of baptize it. They pour the water of baptism over these, not pagan ideas, but these ideas that are found in the pagan philosophers of, uh, of, human, in, of human activities that, are, that benefit and, and uh, make better our human nature. And so we, the first person to... Um, well, actually, uh, do I want to also do that? Now, yeah, skip over Lactantius. The person I want to focus on is St. Ambrose of Milan. You can skip over Lactantius. I'm not going to talk about him. Uh, I want to focus on St. Ambrose of Milan, who lived around 340 until 397 AD, and he was a, a, a saint. He was a bishop of the city of Milan in northern Italy. And it was Ambrose of Milan who took over the traditional list of the cardinal virtues found in Plato and Aristotle and brought them into Christianity, kind of made them part of the Christian heritage as well. 
And there's a picture of Ambrose from a church, a mosaic of little, a mosaic is little bits of a stone or tile, colored tile that are, are kind of glued onto a wall in the form of a picture. And uh, we can see when uh, that Ambrose, uh, excuse me, that mosaic was made, it's dated to the 400s AD. You see when he died, 397. So that might be a very accurate portrayal of what Ambrose of Milan actually looked like in this case. So there he is. So that's what you need to remember about Ambrose of Milan for a future quiz or something. He's the one who brought the cardinal virtues into Christianity, kind of baptized them, made them, normalized them for Christians saying, hey, this is also truth. This is something that we can use and is a, is a good thing. It comes from God ultimately because it's part of our human nature, which was created by God. Nevertheless, we should not forget that humankind is still wounded by sin and needs God's help. But God can give his grace, his help, which is what grace is, to elevate these natural human efforts, to elevate them um, with his grace. How does God elevate them? Well, there are three ways. And these are the three other virtues we're going to talk about. We talk, just talked about the acquired virtues. Now we're going to talk about the infused virtues. What are the infused virtues? The virtues that are poured into us by God. Well, there are three of them. Faith, hope, and charity. Or you could also say love. These are called the three theological virtues. So you have the four cardinal virtues, which are the hinge virtues, but are based on our human nature. Um, they are things that we can act upon and, and develop out of our human nature. The theological virtues, no. The, they're theological because the word theos in Greek means God. Oh, I'm losing her. Theos means God. In Greek. So theological means the study of God, so it's the adjective, adjectival form. So these virtues derive from God, hence they are called theological. They are immediately caused by God. And what do they do? The theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity confer the capacity, the capacity, the ability for supernatural activity. Okay, the cardinal virtues do not. The cardinal virtues are natural in that sense. They, they, they are focused on our, our natural abilities. They don't raise us above the, the, the level of our, our human nature and what we're able to do. For that, we need God's grace. We need God's help. So that, that comes from the theological virtues, which make, give us the ability for supernatural activity. Although they remain undeveloped, like any virtue, the theological virtues can be there, but they need to be developed and worked on. The theological virtues are habits because through their practice, the powers of these virtues become true principles for a new kind of activity. So it's a capability, but a capability is just there. It's potential. It has to be actuated. It has to be made active. The theological virtues are theological because... I'm right there with you, Ms. Teja Zoheda. <laughs> I'm not far away. I need, a, I need a cup of coffee. Let's see if I do that. Okay, I'm not there yet. The theological virtues are theological because they have God as their object. They come from God and they lead towards God. They order us for participation in God's life. They make us, they make us capable. It's kind of like oxygen. You need to be able to breathe the air of heaven, which is the presence of God, union with God. And to be able to do the natural virtues aren't enough for that, although they help. And God can certainly give his grace to elevate someone above the natural virtues, if he chooses. But, um, but these virtues, their purpose is to make us to be able to breathe the air of heaven.
They are infused, which means they can't be acquired through human effort. They're given through the whole God's Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. Um, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so God in his power, you know, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. If you want to know more about the Blessed Trinity, then take Christian faith with me um, in the spring, and I'll have one whole class or a couple of classes where I talk about the Christian view of God. But anyways, and what the Blessed Trinity is. But the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit is the one who is, that's his special purpose. I mean, God, there's one God. It's not like one part of God does one thing, one part of God does the other thing, and the other part of God does the third thing. No, they're, you know, they all have the same um, functions and, thing, and things that they do, I'm trying to think of the word that, uh, proper word, but uh, it's not coming to me, coming, popping into my head. Missions, that's what the word I'm looking for. They all have the same mission, but some have more specific missions, and the, specific, and the Holy Spirit is involved in, in this, kind of the spiritual, supernatural aspect of our lives. And so these, these virtues come through the Holy Spirit. God sends his Holy Spirit into the soul to, to actuate, to make active these virtues, to give them. And they can only be known through revelation. They're not necessarily reasoned to, but they are given to us through revelation. The theological virtues super elevate. They raise above and beyond. Um, they, ra they super elevate us to live in Christ. And they take root in such a way that the human person can be rendered fit for the realization of existence in Christ. And like any other virtues, if you don't practice them, you can lose them. You know, if you don't, if you don't go to the gym after a while, you notice that your muscles can feel weaker, you get flabbier, and whatever. It's the same thing with the natural virtues. If you don't practice prudence or justice, you can find that it's harder for you to be just or to be prudent. You don't, you're not necessarily, you can get a foggy mind and not be clear about how to practice these things. It's the same thing with faith, hope, and charity. If you don't practice the faith, you don't believe anymore. You know, you might find one day you don't believe anymore because you didn't practice it. It's a virtue. Speaking of faith, let's go to the first. Whoops, sorry. Let's go to the first one, which is faith. What is faith? We've already had the word faith, actually, so I don't have to beat a dead horse here. But uh, basically, believing in God and in his revelation, because you believe that God is truthful, and he can neither be lied to, or nor does he lie. Okay, which is a good thing in a God, because <laughs> imagine if God were not truthful. Imagine if that were, I mean, a lot of what people believe about God, they get from Judaism and Christianity, even if they're not Christians or Jews. You can be an atheist, but in, in, even in your conception of a God, you can, you, it kind of seems natural to you that a God should be truthful and good and have virtues. But that's not always the case. And if you look in other world religions, for example, you find, in, which are, in my opinion, humanity's kind of search for God, which is why I say they're human, they're human religions as opposed to Christianity and Judaism, which are God's revelation about what he truly is. You don't find the gods being truthful. You don't find them being good. Say, for example, Hinduism. You have two types of gods. You have the gods that are good, but you have gods who are evil which are the demons. And you have to worship both because they're still gods. So the demons want to harm you. The, the demons are violent. The demons are harmful gods. But they're still gods, and people will still worship them in Hinduism um, because they're, they're divine. They're divine creatures. So interesting. Think about that. What kind of a revolutionary thought that was for the Jews to say, no, God is good and God is truthful. That is part of his nature, and that's why I believe in him. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, no, I'll get there, uh, number 1, 1814, I guess I'll write that on the board, 1814, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1814. Faith means a total commitment to God both knowing and following his will. Or trying to follow, I should say. And in 1815, 
it talk, says something that I just said, but I'll say it again. Faith remains in one who hasn't sinned against it. In other words, you can sin against the virtue of faith. You can lose faith. You can lose your faith through acts of unbelief or disbelief. If you, if you choose not to practice the virtue or if you choose to do something contrary, like as I taught with my exercise analogy, if I choose not to go to the gymnasium or to work out, I can get flabby. But I can all, so that's a way I can sin against that virtue. Um, but I can also, just, I'm just not practicing it, but I can also sin by, act, by actively acting against it, like eating a lot of junk food as well. So I'm acting against it. You can do the same thing with the virtue of faith. You can just simply not practice your faith, not learn about it or what you believe. And so you can eventually lose it or not understand it, but you can also sin against it by actively acting, acting against it. Saying, you know, um, by just looking at things you watch on YouTube or TikTok or, or uh, television that constantly attack your faith or raise up questions. Not that questions are bad things, but you have to be able to think about them. If you don't know how to answer them or you don't know how to think about them, then you can lose your faith. It might be dangerous. Since the church was founded by Jesus Christ, who is a supernatural figure, he's God the Son, in the flesh, the virtue of faith also includes what the church proposes for belief about God. We talked about this with the magisterium, that Christ, has, Christ promised his followers that he knew he was leaving, he knew he wasn't going to stay on earth, he wasn't going to be with his followers forever. And so the question is, well, how do we preserve this legacy? And this is a, this is a sociological question. This happens with every religion. How do you preserve the legacy of the founder? And Jesus promises that I will give you God, the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit to lead you into the truth so that you don't manipulate or you don't distort the teaching that I've presented. So faith extends to the church as well. The next one is hope. Hope. Hope comes from um, an old English word, hope beyond, which I did not put on the PowerPoint because it means exactly the same thing. Hope is to hope. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same word uh, in English. Uh, there's been no development really in the meaning, which is, the, in this case, it's, it, you know, hope is expectation. It's anticipation for something in a general way. In the theological way, it's the desire to receive eternal life from God as the goal of one's final happiness. That's what hope is. In a general way, as I said, it's an expectation, it's an anticipation. You, you hope, to hope means you wish for something to be the case. You wish for something to be true. Could be anything, you know? I hope I'll be able to get tickets for the Taylor Swift concert, Eras Tour. Ain't gonna happen, <laughs> because there are too many people getting them. And also they have the bots, which buy them all up before anyone can get on the website, or as soon as they open them. But you hope. You wish for it to be the reality. You expect, it can be a confident expectation. You expect confidently to get something, okay? And this is the same kind of idea. You are expecting, you are anticipating to receive everlasting, nonstop life from God. And, and you recognize that that is the goal. When you're hoping for something, there's a goal. There's a, there's a finality to that hope. There's an end to that hope that you're, you're hoping with. The goal, there's a purpose. And it could be, as I said, I mentioned Taylor's tickets to a Taylor Swift concert. That's my goal, the goal of my hope. But in the case of Christian hope or theological hope, your goal is to be with God forever as the completion of happiness. So eternal life, you could also say salvation or heaven if you want to use a more metaphorical term or poetic term, heaven simply means sky. Um, but basically, eternal life is life in God's loving presence, whatever that's going to be. I have no idea what it's going to be, but I do know one thing, Ms. De La Cruz, it will include an Indian buffet. Because I know if it ain't, there ain't no Indian buffet there, Ms. Pullman, that I ain't in heaven. <laughs> I'm in hell, Ms. Mitchell. Which they do have an Indian buffet in hell as well, but the bhajis are all 
all hard and overcooked and the tikka masala is over spiced you know it's like ah this is hell the devil's like yeah it's hell welcome to hell welcome to the octagon mr diesel Eternal life is not brought about through human effort. It's what we want and what we tend towards. It's an inclination, communion with God. Remember, that was the third inclination that Thomas Aquinas noticed as part of the natural law. One of the, part of the third inclination was community, but also communion with God. God is, that's the highest inclination, is to be with God. And heaven is a community as well. It's not like we're going to be alone in heaven. The belief is we'll be with everyone, everyone who is saved. Hopefully we'll all like each other. We should. So eternal life is not brought about by human effort, but the pouring out of grace, uh, excuse me, the pouring out of God's grace, through again, through the Holy Spirit. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1818, hope responds to our aspiration for happiness that God has placed in the human heart. happiness, um, which is kind of different from, say, in virtue ethics. Remember when we talked about, again, the virtues in the Greek and Roman philosophers, where what, what was the goal of virtue? What was the ultimate goal of virtue? It's a Greek word. Does anyone remember? It began with an E. It began with an E. It meant good spirit or good demon. You could translate it literally, but I wouldn't say demon, because usually demon has a negative connotation, but demon in Greek simply means a spirit. What do you think, Mr. Thatch? You don't know? It might show up on the final exam. The goal of virtue, the ultimate goal. Let's wait. I'll wait until Ms. Reezer comes back and I'll spring it on her. Why do I think Ms. Reezer watch her jump? <laughs> Begins with an E. Eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. Good spirit. Good spirit. That's what you're supposed to be tending towards in virtue ethics, to giving a good spirit, which means kind of like an, a calm spirit in that way. But this is kind of different. Happiness. No, this, is, this has a point of view to it. It's not just that you're supposed to take the good and the bad equally, because bad is not a good thing. You want to be happy. This is also very different from our modern times, because those of you who are studying social work and stuff who will study counseling and have to start, take some psychology classes, you know, you'll find out that the, the purpose of, say, going to a counselor or a psychologist is not to make you happy. That's what they call homeostasis. It's kind of like eudaimonia, homeostasis, kind of make you on an evil, even keel, an even level. So you're not too manic, but you're not too depressive. You're bipolar, you know, you're, you're balanced in the way you're supposed to be. But no! Hope is, our, the goal of our, our, the finality of human life is to be happy, which is pleasure, pleasurable. And that ultimate happiness is, it's there, it's drawn, we're being drawn to happiness by God, because he's our ultimate happiness. The risen Jesus is the sign and confirmation of our hope. As Paul says in one of his letters, um, I, f I forget, if it's one of the Corinthian letters. I think it was read this Sunday at, at the Catholic Mass. But anyways, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, if Jesus is still a corpse somewhere, his bones are somewhere, we, know not, we don't know where, um, if it's all a myth, then Christians are hopeless. You have no hope. But Paul says in one of his letters, you shouldn't grieve like other people because you know you have a hope. You, have a, you know there's a goal to your existence, which is beyond death. The fact that God, even God died, in a sense, because Jesus is the son of God. God dies and goes to the experience of death, but breaks death by being raised from the dead. This is a confirmation of the hope.
The last of the three virtues is charity, or as it's commonly called, love. And I know in my, in my experience, I've known people who will, you know, go to the mat on this word and be like, no, it's charity. Don't say love because love can mean all sorts of things. It can mean sexual love. It can mean, you know, you love ice cream. You know, you, love, you know, people misuse the word love. Use charity, char caritas in Latin. That's what the word is. And yeah, but it's love. I mean, that's, you know, if you look in a dictionary, a Latin dictionary, and look at what caritas is, the, the, like the first word is going to be love. You know, Lieben in German. It's, uh, you know, okay, people, people extend love and use it in all sorts of different ways, but we do that with all sorts of words, and we don't stop using them. But I'm just saying that because some people, you know, they get, uh, you know, they get, you know, it stuck, sticks in their craw, as they say, you know, that people misuse the word love. So say charity. So I give you charity, the traditional word, but I'll use love because I think it's, it's a good word, too. And it's more understandable than charity. People think that charity is like giving money to something. You know, you give money to poor people or to an organization to help people out, which is an act of love. So it's an act of charity. But people don't necessarily understand that. They, they, they understand love, but charity can be misconstrued, so I'll use love. What is love? Love is, as I've mentioned, I've given you, I think I gave you a definition of love before, or care. It's compat, another word you could use is compassion, care for another person. But the theological virtue of love is the love of God above everything else and of other human beings because of love of God. So it's essentially a crystallization, a repetition of the, the greatest commandment, which is love of God and love of neighbor. That's the theological love. Jesus made charity or love the new commandment of his followers. That, that was to be the identifying mark of, of his followers. And hopefully you see that. A lot of, I think a lot of times you don't, unfortunately. That's just my opinion. You can say I'm wrong or whatever. But, you know, for me, one of the greatest arguments against Christianity is Christians. They don't, you can look in the history of Christianity and ask how many times have Christians opted for the virtue of love over the worldly virtues, the worldly virtues of hate or aggression or selfishness, and sometimes not so much. Um, but Jesus made that the standard for his followers. He said, this is how people will know you're my followers, if you love one another, if you show love to one another, which means not causing harm or disbenefits towards each other. It doesn't mean you agree on everything, and sometimes with love you have to part ways because you, the agreement is so strong, but you know, it doesn't mean that you have to go to war with each other, kill each other, burn each other at stakes, you know, <laughs> cut each other up, you know, stuff like that. <sighs> Good times, Mr. Dietzel. <laughs> the Inquisition, let's begin the Inquisition. Look out, sin, the Inquisition. Okay. <laughs> no Mel Brooks fans, apparently. Charity or love is the foundation of all the other virtues. So if I ask you on, on a quiz, what is the foundation of all the other virtues? Charity. Love, it motivates all the other virtues. Love for God, but also love for oneself. That's where the natural virtues come in. You love yourself, so you want to make yourself better. You know, like putting makeup on. The virtues are like putting makeup on. You know, if you're, well, whoever you are nowadays. <laughs> I was going to say if you're a woman, but you know, I guess guys put on cologne, so stuff like that. But anyways, uh, you know, you, you, why do you do it? You, you want to smell nice. You want to look nice. You know, it's not necessarily selfishness or whatever, but you, you want to, you're beautiful and you want to look, show it that you're beautiful. So, you know, uh, you love yourself. So love motivates the other virtues. The other virtues are like earrings and makeup and cologne or perfume that we wear on ourselves to make ourselves be, be prettier or be better. Virtues are kind of the same way. Love should animate and inspire the practice of the virtues. Otherwise, the virtues are fruitless. As Paul says in another one of his letters in 1 Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, if I have not love, I'm like a banging drum or a banging gong. You know, a, a gong is like a like a, uh, a symbol, you know, in a band, you know, with drums. You know, you have the symbols, 
you know a gong is like a big one of those big metallic symbol it's boom you hit with a big hammer or some boom i'm just i'm nothing you know i i can he's like i can give my body to be burned for the faith you know i can give myself to be burned i could speak in tongues in the name of the lord but if i'm not loving then all else doesn't matter love fulfills the law And so, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1827, the practice of all the virtues is animated, finds its soul in, that's where anima means soul, so the practice of all the virtues are animated and inspired by charity, by love, which, quote, binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's a quote from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 14, so it's a quote from Scripture. So, love binds together all the other virtues and makes them harmonious together and work together. Love is the form of the virtues. In the same way that the soul is the form of the body, it gives, it gives the form to our, it gives a living form to our lifeless, the lifeless material that forms our body. Love is the form of all the other virtues, Ms. McLean. It undergirds them and animates them. It gives them their form. It articulates and orders them amongst themselves, which virtues you need to practice and in what order they need to be practiced. Love is the source and the goal of their Christian practice. Charity upholds and purifies our human ability to love and raises it to the supernatural perfection of divine love. So it raises it, it's, it's super, this word I used before, it super elevates. Yes, we naturally love we have this feeling of love, this passion of love. But this is different. The theological love raises it to another level. So it raises it to the level of God's level and, the, and, and, and perfects it, makes it better, makes it perfect. What does this have to do with the real world? Well, think about what happened on October 7th in Israel. What happened on October 7th in Israel? The country of Israel. Go ahead, Mr. Deeds. Uh, it was between uh, Palestine and Israel, Israel with having to do with the Gaza Strip. Okay. What about the Gaza Strip? Uh, it's been like, I think they've been battling over since like getting time, getting time or whatever. It's been like a constant war. It's not like anything new. Yeah. So but it's just a strip of land that people claim was someone else's. That was like, it's like people's old claims and the land is like switched over like so much that people still have their original claims from the very beginning of when some like thousand years earlier took something over that wasn't there. Okay. So it's only two. Now when you say someone, which ones are we talking about? Which are the two oh, groups like, involved? Like so it's Jerusalem and Palestine. Religion. Jerusalem and Palestine. Yeah, it's also two different religions as well, right? Okay. But not religion's part of it, not all of it, but uh, but which two groups are we talking about here? Which are the two groups of people? Jerusalem's a city. Palestine is a, is a region. What are the two groups of people who are fighting? Do you know? Uh, I don't remember the names. Okay. Right, does anyone remember the names, Ms. Uh, Pullman? Uh, is it like Israelites? We're talking about Israel. Yes, the country okay. of Israel. So we're talking about like the... Do you have one of the groups? And the Palestinians. Okay, so the Palestinians, yes. Yes, but not all Palestinians are Muslims, actually. In fact, a large contingent are more Christian, or many of them have moved out because of the trouble there. But, anyway. um, but they're not all Muslim, but a lot, large portion of them are. Um, it's the Hamas. It's the Hamas, right? Hamas, yes. It's terrorist group. They wouldn't say they're a terrorist group, but our government identifies them as a terrorist group, so I'll go with that. Hamas. Um, which is a Palestinian terrorist group, and uh, the Israelis, not the is Israelites, if, yes, if it was like 2,000 years ago. <laughs> but now they're the Israelis, for you know, people who are members of the nation state of Israel. So what happened on October 7th in this region? What happened on October 7th? You don't know. <laughs> well, that's honest. That's good. You don't know. I, uh, not everyone follows the news. I understand. You're like, I got you. Let me miss folks. They were bombed and attacked. 
They who? The Israelis. The Israelis. By who? Hamas. Hamas is Palestinian terrorists. They, they came over the, you mentioned the Gaza Strip, um, where a few couple million of Palestinians are living. Let me show you where it is. We don't have far to go. We just go down here to the country of Israel. And you can see Israel is, is a mess because there's the West Bank area, which is also Palestinian. You've got the Golan Heights up north. And then down here, there's a small strip of land, as Mr. Dietzel pointed out, which is called Gaza, which uh, here it is here on the coast. You've got a couple million people who were living there, who are kind of living there. Most of them have moved to the south, have been evacuated to the south because Israel is bombing the north. Gaza City up here. Yes, um, members of the Hamas group came across the border. They Well, they shot missiles across the border into the cities of Israel and killed people, but they also came across the border and entered towns and killed people and took a few hundred, a couple hundred hostages. Um, and uh, so this was a surprise attack, and it was something that was, you know, uh, very astonishing because they killed um, something like 1,400, 1,500 Israelis, which doesn't seem like a large number, but if you consider the fact that it was the largest mass killing of Jewish people is, or Israeli people since the Holocaust in the, in the 40s. So for, you know, for, for Jews, that just sets off all sorts of alarm bells and rage and, and all sorts of uh, bad emotions. So Israel is now at war and is bombing Gaza. What's my, uh, that's just the background of my, my question. My question is the theological virtue of love. Practical implications. Because this is theory. What if what if Israel responded in love? What would that look like? To someone who had done something evil. Now normally go ahead, sir. I feel like a negotiation, right? Like meet with two leaders and negotiate like a peace treaty or something like that. Okay. Is that love or no? Huh? Is that love or no? I guess yeah, sure. If you're not killing people, I guess that could be love. I mean, what is the natural I mean, what is the natural inclination? There's no natural inclination. If someone harms you, what do you do to them? Intentionally harms you. Wrongfully harms you. What do you do to them, Ms. Reyes? I guess you respond. You respond. You respond. Out of, you can respond out of justice, right? It could be, you could be exercising the virtue of justice. You give them what they deserve. They deserve to be retaliated against for what they did to you. That's justice. You're balancing the scales. All right, that's a natural virtue. And there, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You find this even in the Bible. That's natural justice and can be practiced. Yes, yes, Mr. Uh, Thatch. Would it be an eye for an eye for the Palestinians? Hmm. In what way, sir? <coughs> Past seventy-five years, full conflict. Wait. All of a sudden, you know something, and you've just been sitting there silent. I mean, I didn't want to be controversial. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, let me twist in the wind up here. I'm dying. Mr. Thatch has some knowledge. Don't do that, sir. You're not here at a university to have knowledge. Right. <laughs> yeah, some people, some people could argue that and have argued that, that the occupation, uh, that, that Israel is kind of an occupying force or an oppressive force to the Palestinians, not allowing them to have freedom or rights to be a country. And so this is resistance. Yeah, so no, I understand that. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get at, I guess, and this is also kind of controversial because I could have used the example of September 11th, which is a little closer to home. But, you know, that natural inclination is towards, you could call it vengeance, but also just, it's called retributive justice, retribution where a person has harmed you and now they have to pay for that harm. They have to kind of pay you back for that harm. But what I'm trying to get at with the point, trying to explain how love, the theological virtue of love should super elevate the virtues to lift them to a higher level where there's maybe forgiveness 
and mercy. And forgiveness doesn't mean a person deserves it. It's given. And I'm wondering if the response had been forgiveness and mercy, what would that look like? I'm just asking. I'm not saying that I'm not telling Israel. I'm not an Israeli. I'm not a Jew. So I have no stake in it. So I'm not I'm not judging anybody. Um, well, I shouldn't say I'm not judging. I have my opinions, but I'm not going to tell anyone uh, how to do this. But I'm wondering, just throwing it out there, how would it look differently if we use this virtue of love? I just want to show you how it elevates and should raise up the other virtues to another level, God's level, okay? Because God, I think, hears the cry of an Israeli child the same way he hears the cry of a Palestinian child. He does, all he hears is suffering. I don't think he hears that, you know, whatever. Um, all right. Whoops. Where are we here? Nope. Oh, okay. Now, let's get to bioethics. Well, we're talking kind of, this, these are useful for bioethics, I think, the virtues. And I've kind of talked about it a little bit, but let's get dig down a little bit deeper. Because there are professional virtues of medical, medical ethics and of medicine. What are they? This comes from a book, Lawrence McCullough, Historical Dictionary of Medical Ethics. And there are certain professional virtues which you are called on to develop if you are going into the medical profession, the medical field. Um, and I told you before that these are the, the, I've talked about the central virtues, the cardinal virtues and theological virtues, but there might be other things that are also virtuous that, that come up beneath them. I mentioned, for example, religion is considered a virtue and it comes under the virtue of justice. Um, and so there might be other virtues. You know, friendship is a virtue which would come under, I don't know if it would come under justice as well, or what would we think friendship would come under? Hmm. I wonder. Well, it will come under one of the virtues, but friendship is sometimes identified as a virtue. Um, pleasure is a virtue, you know, having, having pleasure, but pleasure would come under temperance and stuff like that, the exercise of pleasure. But there are professional virtues. Number one, compassion. The professional virtue of compassion. The professional virtue of integrity. The professional virtue of self-effacement. And the professional virtue of self-sacrifice. What does each of these, whoops. What are these? Briefly speaking. Compassion, and I've already given you a definition, I think, of no, maybe I didn't give you a definition of compassion, is feeling for somebody, having care and concern for somebody. And the, eth the professional virtue of, uh, of compassion for a nurse or a doctor is the ethical obligation to recognize when a patient is at risk of, of distress, pain, or suffering. That's what the professional virtue of compassion is. It also includes acting, okay, the effective action of preventing distress, pain, and suffering when they occur. And to do that, you would provide part of the uh, virtue of compassion is providing effective clinical management of that pain, distress, and suffering. The professional virtue of integrity and integrity is a Latin word. It comes from two Latin words, in, which means in, and integrity, which comes from the Latin word tango, tango, tangere, tetigi, tactum, which means to touch. So all touching together, so all bound together. That's what integrity is. When all, everything that you do when you are all kind of touched together and are bound together, you're said to be integral. You have integrity. You know, you, you kind of, you're consistent, you could say, um, in how you think, how you act how you feel, that's integrity. So the McCullough calls this a bedrock virtue of professional medical ethics, integrity. Why? Because ethically, the professional virtue of integrity obligates the healing professional to adhere to standards of intellectual and moral excellence in, for example, his or her education, patient care, and scientific research. So three things, education, educating yourself, making sure you know what you're supposed to know in order to treat patients, treating, actually treating the patients, patient care, 
and then being up to date about how to treat the patient. So scientific research. And I, I don't think science, scientific research, maybe this is an old model, but you know, it's certainly part of, of medicine, but I don't know if in modern medicine, there's so, so much the push. Some, some hospitals are research hospitals and they, they push, push, push for the people who are there, the doctors and the nurses to bring the results of their practical efforts to, to write a paper or something or to, to do something in a lab. But I think a lot of places, they just want the practical results. They want you to treat patients and whatever. Sometimes if you have a really interesting case, an unusual case, someone might say, hey, you should publish, you should write this down and publish a paper on it. And sometimes they do require that if you, for example, if you want to become chief of surgery or something, you want to, to go up in, in the, on the levels, um, but not necessarily. So scientific research is certainly a part of it, of this virtue. Healthcare professionals or professionals or healing professionals are required to integrate these into his or her life through sustained adherence to standards. Okay, and you see this in codes of ethics and in um, you know what what uh, hospitals or institutes expect of you. You expect that you're going to continue. You're going to have continuing education credits that you will have to earn as you go along. This is for people who go into social work as well as people who go into medicine and to nursing. You're going to, you can't, your education doesn't stop. You're going to have to go to seminars and have seminars. You have to read articles which can be, have, you know, you'll notice on some of the articles that will say this applies two points against your continuing education credit so that they're verifying. You can verify that you're continuing this virtue of integrity. Self-effacement is the ethical obligation or the virtue to be aware of differences between the physician and the patient, but basically not to let those differences come in the way of clinical care. Okay, there may be differences of ethnicity, the way a person dresses, language, immigrant status, race, religion, sex, gender, etc., 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 but these are, self-effacement means that the, clinic, that the healing professional does not regard them as clinic if they're not clinically relevant um, then the healing professional will not let them bias his or her deliberative clinical judgment or patient care now if they are relevant then obviously it does i mean you can have a person who comes in who's a transgender man but has a uterus and so you have to you know treat the fact that that reality is there and you might have to they might have uterine cancer for example so you might have to treat that fact but self-effacement means that you don't treat a, you, you, it's not clinically, if it's not a clinically relevant aspect, like the person you're treating is a, is a female or a male or Hispanic or white or whatever, or doesn't speak English or does, you don't treat them with bias, self-effacement. You treat the, 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 the situation that's there. The virtue of the professional virtue of self-sacrifice means that a, a healing professional has an ethical obligation to take reasonable risks to the physician's convenience, family life, health, own life, and time in patient care and research. And this is kind of a controversial one, and this might be, and McCullough admits that this is one of the most pressing challenges for setting ethically justified limits on this obligation. Because if you have a family injustice, you owe things to your family. Your family deserves your presence, it deserves your care, deserves your, your affection. There are things that I, I owe if I had a wife and children. I injustice owe them things just as much as I owe my patients. And so on this pack, you have to be, you have to take, you have to be prudent again. You have to figure out What's enough if I'm spending all my time at the hospital treating patients? Yes, that's a virtue. It's self-sacrifice. I'm, I'm risking my time, but I'm also risking my family life, which could lead to disbenefits to me. It could lead to a divorce. It could lead to my, my spouse feeling un, unwanted or my children feeling un, unwanted or uncared for. So you have, to, you have to balance that. You have to use prudence in that, the other virtue of prudence. 
but you also self-sacrifice. You take, you do commit yourself to taking risks to your own life. I mean, you are around sick people who can infect you with their illness and can infect you with their sickness, possibly. So that's part of the the professional virtue of self-sacrifice. Again, you need other virtues like prudence to know and temperance to know the balance that needs to be done and when to do these things and when not to do these things. Now, prudence tells me that, you know, if I have to go in to treat a patient who is quarantined or is, is, is marked off from the west of the wing because they, you know, have an airborne illness and I have to dress up in a gown and a mask and all that, obviously, prudentially, I have to do that. That's part of my job. And that's what I can choose to do. But also, it's not, it's imprudent for me to just walk into all these rooms just because I want to. You know, I just want to see how the person is. If I have no reason to, then, then I'm being imprudent. I'm, even if I'm there to treat the patient, you know, if it's not, you're being imprudent. Or if I'm not wearing a mask or wearing a, a gown or gloves or what is suitable for that room, I'm being imprudent. I'm violating that virtue. So self-sacrifice has to be, all these professional virtues need to be brought into connection with other virtues. Okay, that's what I got for that. Remember, we have class next Tuesday, but not next Thursday, remember, because of Thanksgiving. So just, just I want to mention that, remind, remind you of that. Have a good weekend. God bless you all. Don't forget about quiz number four due tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>